Welcome, Eleanor. Thank you so much for joining me on the Prowess Podcast. Ashley, I have so many mutual contacts and friends who adore you. I'm so glad that we are finally connected personally. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to dive into the conversation I was sharing with you earlier. I've listened to your podcast for at least two years at this point. So, um, your background is so interesting, Eleanor, because you are a descendant from Fijian warriors and <laughs> you have such an awesome presence in your brand around fierce feminine leadership. So let's dive into how you've spent your career, the awesome metamorphosis that you've come from, first as a journalist, then a consultant, now as a coach. Um, you've seen it all, researching extraordinary women leaders. So talk to me about what you've seen in the landscape of female, fierce feminine leadership, and what sets these women apart from other people. I love this question because, you know, to me, curiosity is this thread, you know, that has linked all these different phases really of my career and the development of my work. And curiosity in terms of, you know, for there was a big part of my career in which, you know, I was a journalist and then a consultant doing a lot of interviewing and research with women who were leading some of the fastest growing companies in this country. And so I was doing a lot of profiles and specialization, looking at the trends and the strategies that they used and all of that kind of stuff. But what was personally so fascinating to me was who they were as women. Because I think, you know, any one of us can take a really smart strategy and implement it. But to do that consistently over time, to be able to be the person to, you know, to, to get up, overcome obstacles and see that strategy through the end, pivot when need be, that's what I was really fascinated with. And so there are a couple of things, you know, as I, of course, when I look at these high powered women, they came from different backgrounds, you know, different, they had different religious beliefs, different cultural upbringings, but there are two core things that I saw again and again. So the first was this willingness to iterate, you know, this willingness to experiment, to change their minds, to course correct, to not, um, to, to take sort of that imperfect, to be willing to take that kind of imperfect path and to create as they go. I think that was really huge because, you know, when we think about the, the business landscape, the pace of change, being willing to iterate, to, to shift, to be open to change, both in terms of your strategy, but who you are as a leader, that's critically important. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is to bring an extraordinary level of commitment, hmm. you know, like an extraordinary level of commitment to their vision. And that I think in and of itself is, is rather a feminist act you know, to be like, this is what I want. This is my intention, my explicit ambition. This is what I want to create in the world. And I am going to commit to that above all else, you know, and I see that and I'm going to do that in a way that's inclusive, that builds community. Uh, but those are the two factors that I have seen again and again, that really characterize powerhouse women leaders. Mm. It's so interesting to hear you say this because what you're describing is a paradox. So I want totally. to go right in there. <laughs> How can you be, on the one hand, so able to change your mind and pivot while also being radically committed? Ooh, How yeah. How do people do that? Yeah. So amazing question. And to me, one is the pathway that takes you there. And one is the final destination. So to me, that, that, extraordinary commitment is to that vision of where you want to be, you know, that sort of that end goal, although I hesitate to call it end goal because we get there and then there's that new end goal, you know, or we realize, wow, this is amazing. It's not quite, you know, I want more or I want something different. So it's this extraordinary level of commitment to the vision that you've got. You know, that's where, you know, that's sort of, and that's a, an end goal, a destination, the iteration happens in the path required to get there. Um, and I think, you know, that ability, that ability and willingness to do both is, is so critical. And it totally sounds like a paradox. It's why it's so hard to do and so rare, 
Mm. <laughs> right? It's why only 2% of women entrepreneurs ever crack the seven figure mark. It's not an easy thing, right? Um, but therein is where the magic happens. Well, this is why, you know, I love your mission so much because one of the things that I saw, you know, on your website is that you exist to get more women at the table speaking unapologetically and standing at the forefront of change, which I love that so much. And your clients have reported, you know, doubling their income, speaking on top stages, increasing their credibility in the boardroom, and you're the linchpin leader driving all that transformation. So as you guide these women, you know, working with these preeminent leaders, what is the number one way that you're seeing that these women can show up more powerfully if they may be feeling stuck and, you know, ready and needing a pivot? Mm, that's a great question. So um, to me, it comes down to the idea of conviction. Okay. So, right. And so, and it is, and so conviction is, the, the definition of conviction is a powerful belief. You know, it's a powerful belief and communicating in a way that that, um, that sort of shares this powerful belief. That's what conviction is. So very often I find when, you know, I'm working with a woman who might feel, maybe she feels somewhat stuck, somewhat stymied, potentially, uh, you know, with, the, with your audience, the women that we're talking to here, it could be stuck, stymied. It could also quite frankly be a certain level of boredom or ennui <laughs> with what they've achieved. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know what, at this point I could do this in my sleep, you know, and this is no longer exciting for me. We know that growth and transformation is a huge feminine value. And so at that point, can you, I want to pause you for a second yeah. uh, because it cut out when you said they're bored and they can do this in their sleep. So yeah, sure. can you pick up from there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. At this point they're bored and quite frankly could do this in their sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when I am working with women who are at that phase, either they're stuck, mm -hmm. stymied, or they just feel like there's something more or a deeper level of work that they need to uncover, um, what we're looking for there is that sense of conviction. You know what I mean? So what is the impact that they want to make? Why is this so important? Can you, communicate, can you communicate about this first and foremost in a way to yourself that really unleashes this next level of conviction? You know, and conviction is not only a strong belief, but I think it's really that bone deep belief in your ability to do something impossible. Like your ability to make a baller move, to ratchet things up a notch, to take that, you know, to make that transformation that you've been talking to yourself about, but you haven't done when you're stymied, stuck, or, or bored, very often it's time for a baller move. You've got to do something you haven't done before, you know, and in order to do that, you need conviction, self-belief. So I feel it in my core when you say that. Um, I know that everyone listening to this is having a similar feeling because you're right. When you first get started, you're propelled by a desperate drive and hunger that's that initial launch phase of thrust to get something off the ground. But once you achieve a certain level of success, you do kind of lose that edge. And that's actually riskier in the path to the top than if you never got started. So as women think about this and they're listening, okay, I might need to have a baller move. I might need a deeper <laughs> level of connection. <laughs> uh, how do these women start to, or what could you recommend for women to, to dig deep at that mm. soul level and start to unearth this kind of new con conviction so that they can show up more powerfully with more presence? Okay. So there's like, I could be like, go give yourself some, a some affirmations. <laughs> we could do that. And we like that. affirmations. I know we like affirmations. We love affirmations. Um, but the real thing that I'll share, you know, is, and this, this is the most powerful thing to do. And it's also, I think the most difficult thing to do. It is very, every, you know, we've all heard, oh yeah, you have to release this phase. You have to, you know, close this window to open a door. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to say goodbye to this in order to, you know, um, to do that. An analogy that I think about is that, you know, um, 
if you're really ready for a baller move, you're really ready to make a transformation. And this doesn't have to be a radical departure. It can simply be building on work that you have already done. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I find, if you are trying to do something that is impossible, and by that I mean you're trying, it's impossible simply because you haven't done it before. Very often, I think what that means is allowing the part of you that, that wants to feel safe, the part of you that wants to continue treading those well-worn grooves of the pathway that you've treaded before that has, has worked consistently, that, that generates predictable results. Maybe it's continuing to generate predictable results. Maybe it's not. It's like that part of you, you have to walk through a fire, you know, and that, and, and you have to allow our attachment to what people think of us, what people are saying about us, you know, that part, we have to allow it to burn away in order to create something that is more powerful, that is new, that's lighter. And this sounds incredibly dramatic, <laughs> but it's actually quite practical, you know, and I'll give you a specific example. When I started my work, my mission was to transform and support women leaders throughout the entire business world, okay? So I was doing a lot of work with women in corporate. I was doing a lot of work with women entrepreneurs, and that became untenable. It became untenable for me to speak to both audiences as powerfully as I felt like I needed to. It was very difficult though, because I built up a big audience on that corporate side. I'd done this amazing work on this corporate side and I had to let it go to do the work that I wanted to do with entrepreneurs. Um, and, and I had to, you know, I had to walk into the fire. I had to release and I had to be willing to come out the other side, um, knowing that I'd made this big shift, that it was going to have an impact on certain aspects of my business. And I had to be willing to, to, to go in the path of my conviction. Yeah. It's super powerful to hear that story because walking a well-worn path, it gets down to the nature of identity and how we know and understand ourselves to be right. So okay. you making that shift and pivot also required a shedding of an old self of how you understood yourself, competent, convicted, confident in this area, and actually stepping into what you could imagine yourself to be, which yeah. hopefully worked out, right? But yeah. <laughs> at that point, you're not sure. So you're not sure. <laughs> you're not sure. Yeah. So how did that go for you as you're starting to <laughs> start? <laughs> You know what was so, so this is so fascinating because I love I the a data new audience too. now. Yeah, I love the data too. So, you know, as far as how it went for me, so there's two things. There's both the outside. So there's like the business side of like the, the sort of metrics that we all pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And then there is what happens internally. Okay, so I'll start with the metrics first. What is so fascinating to me is that, so we cut half our audience we cut a major revenue stream and we continued to grow our revenues and really grow our profits, PS. So we not only grew our revenues, but we also by a significant percentage, but we also grew our profits by even more because it's, you know, the more like simplification, right? Mm. Simplification is sort of the queen of profit. So that happened. Our overall, you know, the, the metrics that we measure, like who's listening to our show, how many inbound calls are we having coming in, you know, from people who want to work with us, those numbers went up and the qualification of those numbers went up too. So it actually, it, oddly, you know what I mean? The numbers grew. So that was one aspect of it, which was amazing. And, but the second part of it is what happens kind of internally for, for us as leaders. And I think, and this comes down to, I think, radical conviction again, because every time you as a woman leader double down on uh, an instinct, on a baller move that you decide, you know, I'm going to full, I'm going to make this move. I'm going to fully commit to this move. So a couple of things happen. Number one, you reshape your identity as a woman who's betting on herself mm -hmm. and who insources 
<laughs> you know, strategy and decision making rather than outsources that. So that's huge in terms of what happens for you. Um, but there's there's something else that happened, and it was a switch from I found myself moving into a place of greater alignment whereby I wasn't just kind of talking about things. I didn't feel like I had to um, sort of, you know, things that I was doing, like running events, speaking, just with a general day-to-day work that I was doing, it became much, um, it used to drain me. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I find it fuels me. So those were some of the changes that I saw. Yeah. So I want to go back to what you said about how you didn't just talk about things because it cut out for a second. So when, can you close the loop on that point of Mm -hmm. you didn't just talk about things, but you also pruned some elements of the business as well. So, so describe what that looked like. The actual pruning? Yes. Yeah. So, so how far back are we going here? Just that one part where you were saying, you know, I didn't just talk about things, but I actually, you know, was doing all these things like events and things like that, that weren't fueling. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the core things that I noticed from, uh, from making this shift is that things that I used to do that, that felt like energy output. So I would go speak at events. I would create marketing campaigns. Mm-hmm. I would participate in panels. I would run events like inside for my program members. Those kinds of things, I would find that before I made the shift, they were starting to drain me. Mm-hmm. And after I made the shift, after I pruned, I found that these were things that energized me. Mm-hmm. And it actually comes down to integrity. So we talk about integrity a lot in terms of, oh, you know, is somebody like, um, you know, that, that somebody is uh, an honorable man or woman, you know, they do the right thing. Mm-hmm. That's one version of integrity. Another version of te- integrity is where what you believe, what you say, what you feel and how you act are in alignment. Mm. And so for me, pruning, you know, getting really focused in terms of what we're here to do, who we're here to help, and then devoting ourselves, like pushing our energy through that straw, Mm -hmm. you know, it's so much more focused. You have way more energy and ultimately your power grows. Mm -hmm. It focuses your power and grows the impact. Mm. So I want to tie some loops together because I think you're going to be able to help paint the picture of how this looks. So I happen to know that you're an introverted extrovert. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So being an introverted extrovert, uh, running around, doing events, speaking everywhere, um, this is probably very draining. And um, when you talked about, you know, insourcing, it sounds like you had to dig really deep and get super clear on the avenues that work for you. Totally which could be different for everyone, right? Um, But as someone, Eleanor is, Eleanor still is on podcasts and speaking all the time and she is in the spotlight. So how do you think about uh, intentional decision-making on what those opportunities are so you can act with alignment? Mm. So I love this question. And so for me, it goes through, there's a couple of things, you know, that I would do. So the first and foremost, I'm running it through the filters of my values, Mm, like my values, you know? And so, and those shifted also, you know, I used to have five values, (laughs) you know, now I've got three. Um, And again, it was that filtering, filtering, filtering. And so three values, fierce leadership, preeminence, all in right? So Mm -hmm. fierce leadership, taking accountability, leaning into discomfort, making the difficult calls in, in, you know, in support of my future vision. Mm -hmm. That's fierce leadership, preeminent, best in class. (laughs) I'm going to decide my category and I want to be the queen of that category. And that's where I really want to make sure that I am the best that I can be in my own little category of one, you know? So there's that. And then um, all in, so 100% committed to the things that I do. And, you know, 
so many entrepreneurs think about values as like this sort of, yeah, this kind of thing that I have to have. For me, they govern how I run everything, how I decide, how my team decides on things. But having those values, it helped to filter what I did and what I do. Does it match this criteria? And if it doesn't, then it's an easy yes or easy, you know, it's an easy no. And then it's just like pruning, you know, you cut off these extraneous energy leaks where you're trying to like push energy out to do these other things that are not, you've decided are not important and you pour your energy in to the, the vital few, you know, the few things that are critically important. Well, what I love about what you're saying is that so many people think about, okay, but I've been told to do everything to be successful. And what you're describing is that you built your own business and you're the engine behind it. And as CEO, you get to decide the methods and strategies that work in alignment and integrity for you, which is really a breath of fresh air for everyone. Well, I think so. And, you know, and I love, I love this point because to me, it's this ongoing dance, you know, that, that I go through and I'm sure, you know, people who are listening to this go through as well. And it's how do we balance our desire to keep up with trends, Mm -hmm. to learn more, you know, um, to be sort of, to be divergent in terms of our thinking, Mm -hmm. you know, truly divergent, like allowing inputs, being creative, reading the books, taking the courses, listening to the experts, all of that. And how do we, you know, make that decision for ourselves personally, when to go from divergent to convergent? okay, I've got all this material and now I'm starting to batten down the hatches. I'm starting to shut down the input and I'm turning that, you know, focus internal to decide what it is that I want to do. And I think for women in particular, we are really conditioned to outsource authority and to look to others, you know, (laughs) raised from young girls to look to others for the answers, right? you know, not mm-hmm. everybody, but a lot of us are. And so I think that this, be- this is sort of part of how we become, you know, the boss, <laughs> you know, it's like when we make that start to make that decision for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is another shift in identity change because we've also been groomed, you know, men and women into an employee mindset where you have a supervisor and you have, you know, a, hi- a, a hierarchical chain and there's protocol and bureaucracy. And when you start to shift into the CEO of your own life, it gets really, real, really fast. You realize, oh, there's no one else. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) exactly. (laughs) The buck stops with me, you know? Yeah. But that's radical conviction. So I wanna get into that because you've you've mentioned it a few times in this idea of radical conviction. which for many would be a mindset shift in and of itself. It hits me at my core when you say that. So um, let's dig into what radical conviction looks like. And first of all, how did you get started doing your work with radical conviction? I started on this because, you know, when I really started coaching women, Mm -hmm. what I was finding is that um, I was having women coming to me saying that they lacked confidence to do X, Y, Z. Typically it was before doing some form of a baller move. They wanted to make a big, like there's always a reason that you start working with a coach. And typically it's like, you're looking to make some big leap or a change, or, you know, there's, there's an inciting incident always, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm talking to these women and learning more about them. And the evidence um, suggests with no hesitation, no, no, no doubt whatsoever. The evidence of their lives shows me that they are extremely confident women. Mm -hmm. So confidence is like the willingness to raise your hand. So they've, They've put their names in, they've, they, they, they try new things, they're experimenting, they take risks, like all of this. And so it's, I know that it's not confidence. Mm-hmm. And so what I realized is there's a, a, there's a special brand of confidence for when you are, especially to your point, making a shift, a powerful enough shift that it, that it threatens your identity. It, mm-hmm. it, it challenges, you know, the identity that got you where you are today is not the same woman who's going to get you where you are, you know, to this next, that person kind of has to die. So all of your like confidence rules, the comfort zone, everything that you have done to get you where you are today, you can keep doing that rinse and repeat until the cows come home. And some of people want to, and that's totally okay. Some people want to take the next step 
right? Confidence rules the comfort zone. It can't get them there. Now it's about belief, you know, that their belief in their vision, their belief in what it is that they want to create, that's what needs to guide them. So I say that radical conviction governs the growth zone. Confidence is the comfort zone. Radical conviction is the growth zone, (laughs) you know? So that's where I started realizing. And and the problem is that, you know, as an er earlier in my coaching career, I thought that it was about strategy and implementation. Oh, well, it's this, it's this, it's this. And these were, these felt like logical moves, but they were not getting traction because the belief was not there, you yeah. know? And, and when you look at what is it that, um, that, that how do we define what it means to be a woman? Well, there's actually lots of research about that. We define what it means to be a woman in that we are always, all the words that we use to describe femininity are relational. It's always about our relationship with somebody else. And it's classically about how we serve something else. It's never about something that we build for ourselves. That's right? so interesting. So interesting. This, this, this explains our, you know, the, our, sort of ambivalent nature toward our own power. Oh my gosh, that is <laughs> right? so How we can, interesting. Yeah. So this conviction, first of all, we have to believe, we have to be clear about what we want. We have to be fully committed in the rightness of us wanting it, not because it helps other people or we have to, you know, it's the tyranny of having to make a positive impact. Yeah, we want to make a positive impact. You know, Steve Jobs said he wanted to make a ding in the universe. Oprah Winfrey could never get away with that ever. Because that, you know, our, our, how we define what it means to be a woman is always making, you know, it, it's, it's a sort of impact imperative. Not to say that that's wrong, but if you want to do something you haven't done before, you really need to, it's, it's about radical conviction. It's about number one, having that big dream, believing that it's okay, believing in its worthiness and believing in your ability to make it happen. That's radical conviction. It's super necessary. Um, and it's something that, you know, we need to explore more when we think about women's achievement and, you know, women's entrepreneurship and the growth of these initiatives. That is so powerful to hear you say that. Everyone listening to this is probably feeling it in their, in their gut as I, you know, radical conviction and how to foster that within ourselves. Yeah. Um, Are there key steps in the development of radical conviction? Let's say someone doesn't have it. They listen to this, they feel like, I have a dream, but to be honest, I have many dreams. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I want to be successful and I see many paths to that destination. So, how do you drill it. down, like yeah. really laser focus on one path or, or is there, are there many paths? Like yeah. walk us through that. I, I definitely think that there is a hierarchy of things that we care about. You know, there's this great, uh, there's this great limited series. We used to call them mini series, but now mm-hmm. it's called limited series, much more, much more sophisticated on Netflix about Bill Gates. Yes. You know, Bill Gates, who could do anything that he wants to do. And he talks about, there's this great moment where, you know, there's, there's so many places where he could have made an impact. And he says to the filmmaker, at some point you have to decide what you're going to care about. And so if somebody is really struggling, like they, you know, they're kind of riled up and they love the idea of having radical conviction, you see the promise, like it's speaking to you. You're just not sure how to begin to implement in your own life. I think that's the first thing that at the end of the day, you know, it is human nature to have more things, you know, more desires and bright, shiny objects out there than we necessarily have the time to kind of execute or, or, you know, move forward. So I think it's, you know, step one is really sitting back and first, you know, really checking in first with commitments. So what are the things, where are you currently spending your time? What are you currently committed to? I actually like to sort of take an audit of my commitments, 
just my, not even, you know, just my general old commitments. I'm committed to this board. I've been committed to this group. I'm committed to this client. I'm, you know, make a list of the commitments and go through and really ask yourself, does this fascinate me? Because to me, the fascination place, that's, you know, that's what we're all looking for, to be fascinated and engaged. And if it doesn't fascinate you, you know, you've got to ask yourself, why am I doing it? So the first thing always is to make room. So it's prune and cut and prune and cut first. And then in some cases, you're going to automatically know, look, I've got this burning desire to do this. I've got to make room for it. For some of you, you don't know what that burning desire is because you have been plugging up your calendar, your day, your consciousness with a lot of sort of micro commitments or meaningless things that started out great. They're not great anymore. You know, so to me, it always starts with pruning, you know, identifying what are you committed to releasing the things that no longer work for you and then don't fascinate you. And also I think being ruthlessly committed to only filling your life with things that are meaningful. You know, it's just like the act of decluttering, right? So to me, that's a place to start. Um, you can collect, if you've been around the block, you know, if you're in your thirties or forties, you've been around the block as an adult, chances are you have commitments ongoing right now that, um, you know, that, that could be pruned to make room for the great work of your life. It's so powerful to have this conversation with you, Eleanor. I know everyone is resonating with this. I want to put you on the spot. And I know I'm asking you a lot of questions that maybe you weren't prepared for. So thank you. <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> I'm putting you in the hot seat uh, just because I know the tremendous value that you have to offer. And I know everyone's going to love this. So I want to put you on the spot again um, to share personal stories of, you know, how you grew your business because you are, you know, a preeminent leader at this point. You've shed the identity You've stepped into the growth zone, outside of the comfort zone. Was there a particular instance or shift where you began to notice that, ah, this is actually the biggest needle mover for mm. my business in terms of, there's many metrics for success, in terms of overall revenue growth and impact in your business? Yes. Yes. Hands down. And you guys are going to love this because it, to me, it's the simplest one. So um, it is without a doubt through um, associations with power players. And I'll be really specific and give you a bunch, right? A bunch of examples. But this is the thing right now, you know, our, um, when you look at the sort of the marketing landscape and, and here's what moves the needle on growth, there's a lot, which is basically like, let's take this, let's take your tiny hose and like spray it over like millions of people and everybody gets this tiny little drop, which makes zero impact on them. You know, it just, it just doesn't make sense. It defies logic. Yeah. And I, right. But this is and what I, everyone does. This is what everybody does. And I have never, Sean, you know, I did the post recently about the meat market. <laughs> it's like, I can remember being in university. I am six feet tall. I think you're quite tall. Also. I am almost six feet, 5'11". Right? Yes. <laughs> so, and I remember like going to quote unquote, you know, meat market bars, which is where we would go in university. And I always felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. I couldn't, I just could not make an impact in this crowded space. Hmm. So that the idea of like, I met my husband sitting on a plane. I love he was that. Like, right. He was a captive audience. We were both <laughs> sitting in the seat that has had lots of leg room. I had a captive audience and we could just talk. I was in a category of one. Right. So for me, the biggest thing, you know, as I was building my business, I, in the, I can remember initially feeling like I needed to fill my pipeline, with, you know, that the strategies I would use would be these like marketing strategies that would hit thousands of people at once. And some people seem to have great success and traction with them. I never did. Mm -hmm. For me, it has always been about identifying power players. And so these have been both individuals 
who fit certain criteria. They are very respected in their space. They have um, an agenda, and I mean this in the best possible way. They have a, an intention or an agenda, and my gifts, what I contribute to the world, fit into that. Either they are trying to educate about something and I can provide a powerful voice um, in my, so that's typically when you're working with other influencers. So identifying who are the power players, the, lead, the luminaries, the leading lights, how can I actually position myself to get to know them, to have them help to unlock their networks to me? That's been really powerful. You can also do this with organizations. And so you know, as an entrepreneur, like in the early days, one of the biggest things that I did was leverage my networks to land a like corporate sponsorship deals with companies who wanted to attract the women's market and to make sure that they were able to, they were trying to, they had these corporate initiatives that they needed. They couldn't roll it out just through advertising. They needed to form partnerships with people like me who had access to their audiences. They in turn helped elevate my brand and give me access to their major audiences, you know, these larger corporate entities. That, that, was, what, that was what moved the needle. And every time I veer away from that strategy, I get punished <laughs> by, you know what I mean? I get punished by, um, by basically, it, you know, it's just this reminder, oh yeah, that's not the best use of my resources. So aligning with power players, and this strategy is not new. I mean, you know, um, I can remember uh, reading about this like legendary marketing um, marketing mentor. This was a guy who mentored like, you know, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, who talked about, um, you know, the dream 100. Mm -hmm. Basically identify the 100 top players in your market, spend an hour a week networking your way to them that's all you have to do. And that's what they did. And it worked really effectively for them. So that is my strategy alignment. You know, it's, it's that, uh, the power of association and aligning with power players in your space. That's simple. It's so interesting to hear you say that. I did not expect you to say that. Oh. I did not because, um, one thing that I tell people all the time and, you know, you do business training, leadership training and coaching, I'm in the visibility space. One of the biggest wastes of time that I see in my industry is the spray and pray approach, which is that narrow hose, casting a wide net, crossing your fingers to hope something lands. And this is common practice. It's common practice in the industry. Anyone listening to this needs to know and hear in their soul, this does not work in any category of business because it lacks intentionality. And when you think about overall, uh, I'll give an example from my own life, the company has spent tens of thousands of dollars a month in Facebook ads with zero results because of the spray and pray approach. So I'm sure I could have a Facebook ad manager to come on and, and riff about this as well. But um, back to you, you know, the power players need a power squad. That's simple as that. And then we can leverage our own expertise to really help and support each other. Totally. And that's the fastest. And it also feels really good, right? To provide that tremendous value like you're doing right now, just amazing value for everyone. It feels really good. And it's, and, and there's so many things about it. You know, like I can remember um, when I first started doing it, it's, it's really about forming relationships. So first mm -hmm. of all, you know, it was about just sort of leveraging relationships that I had. And for me, that was, you know, talking to people at a networking event, learning more about them, figuring out not like who are the people, you know, I, I know you've had like Marie Forleo, on your show. Mm -hmm. But for instance, back then when I was starting, Marie Forleo would have been like a dream 100. Mm -hmm. But for me, I was much less likely of forming an alignment with her than I was with forming an alignment with a bank that had just as many people on its mailing list, had far fewer people coming to them and saying, look, there's something really exciting happening in the field of women's entrepreneurship. I'm doing this. You need to be a part of it. This is going to be huge for your clients. And that's literally like the kinds of conversations that I was having. So it's looking for power players 
in unexpected places where there's a real blue ocean, there's a real sort of virgin market, <laughs> virgin audience, and PS, often virgin wallets, you know? Uh -huh. And that, those kinds of things, I think like be doing what we do best, being very creative, making these influential relationships and alignments with people who are not necessarily inundated you know, that's one. The other thing was, um, I can remember hearing somebody say this once, which was like game recognizes game. And so making sure that the insecurities that you feel, the trepidation that you might feel, the self-doubt, the imposter syndrome, really understanding, hey, that's about you. So you need to like work that out and park that over here. And then you need to go speak to them with conviction, <laughs> you know, right? Like let's, let's, um, let's take step into our power here. Yes. You experience self-doubt. We all do. Mm -hmm. Let it wash over you, park it over here, go speak with conviction because game recognizes game. And there's no way they're going to put you in front of their audiences. If you're showing up like that, show up. to mm. play. So, Okay. What do you mean by game recognizes game? Because I think I understand it intuitively, but I really want you to define it. Ooh, okay. So here's what I mean. I love, did you play basketball? <laughs> I have never been asked before. <laughs> this is I, material. I know, it, I know. Okay, okay. I know. We're going to have tall girl, tall girl talk. Um, I know, I know. Um, I never played basketball, actually. Okay. So the, here's why I'm asking. So imagine we are playing like pickup basketball outside and there's a, there's a group of people mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you're kind of, I, if I'm picking my team, I'm going to pick the people who I think have the best chances of helping me win. Mm -hmm. And so how do I tell that? There's a few things. I'm going to tell that by how confidently they walk onto the court. I'm going to be able to gauge that by if we're just kind of shooting around, do they actually want the ball or are they kind of sitting on the sideline? Do they look like they want to play? Are they ready? You know, did they bring their best skills? You know, are they showing up confidently? And those are the people that I'm going to choose to be on my team to help me win. When I say game recognizes game, what I'm saying is, you know, if you want to collaborate with people who are killing it, it's really important that you show up authentically, but show that you're ready, mm -hmm. show that you have game, show that you are ready to play. Nobody wants a bench warmer. And this sounds so harsh, but it's legit. I mean, I think everybody listening, who would you rather, you know, partner with somebody who came to you ready to dig in, they've got, you know, skills, they've got a message, they've got something that they've studied your audience. They know they can support, they know what you want. They see the win-win that's the kind of person we want to collaborate with. And I think, you know, that's really critical. That is so key because so many people think, okay, if you just hustle harder, then, you know, you're going to be chosen. The red carpet's going to roll out for you. And those athletes on the field, they all went to the same training practice and some of them are sitting on the bench and some of them are not. Totally. And Part of that is in the level of preparation. Of course, everyone practices yeah. differently, but also, like you said, do you want the ball? Right. Cause you can tell, I mean, this is for your ballers who are listening, like when you're <laughs> playing, you can always tell, like you could always tell when I, when I was playing with people and still do if people actually want the ball or not. Yeah. So if they, people want the ball, they're showing you that they want it. If they don't, they're kind of running around looking busy, but they really don't want to get hit in the head. Yeah. This is, this translate every, uh, to, to everything that we do. And so for me, and it's, and it, this is so interesting for me, it's actually always a big gut check. If we, if we link this back to this idea of commitments, like where are you going to be committed and where are you, the gut check for me is always, do I want this? Mm -hmm. Is this related to something that I want or is this a commitment that's keeping me busy, <laughs> you know, to stay away? Mm -hmm. And I think these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves because at the end of the day, if you're listening to this show, it's because you've experienced success. And so, you know, you can do that, you know, and now it's about that, that next level impact. And this is where it's much more about what we say no to. It's much more about how we focus in. It's much more about the sort of fewer relationships we create. I'll give you an example. Have you read More Than Enough by Elaine Welteroth? 
I have not. And it's on my list. So tell, Listen, tell us. Yes. So good. Okay. This was, this, this book was not what I was expecting. I bought it just cause I like her. Mm-hmm. I didn't expect it to be as good as it is. Mm-hmm. And don't ask me why. I don't know why it was just really, really good, especially the second half. But what's so fascinating about her career um, is that it's one powerful association after another that she created through being a baller. <laughs> you know, right? And and she worked in the corporate world, but this holds true for entrepreneurs too. Hmm. Well, it's how you show up and the value that you offer and that preparation. Yeah. So everyone's listening to this saying, oh my gosh, I need to talk to Eleanor more. I have never heard anyone talk about these issues in a way that resonates with me. I have one more question, but first I want to ask people, um, ask you to share where could people find you or how could they access more of this amazing training and help to propel themselves forward? Oh, I love that. So I would say two places. So the Fierce Feminine Leadership podcast, if you like listening to podcasts, you'll love Fierce Feminine Leadership and then also radicalconviction.com. And so this is where you can, it's, it's, we're sort of taking you into, it's a short micro course, a couple of videos where I'm explaining where this, where this is and let us know that you came through Ashley. I always love to know, you know, the connection points that I have with people who are coming into my community. Mm, and I've signed up for that. I've signed up for Radical Conviction. I'm yes. so excited. And I listened to the podcast. So you guys need to get over there and check it out. It's so amazing. And I want to circle back to a phrase that you mentioned at the top of the conversation, which stuck out to me. And it was explicit ambition. So talk to me. This is the note I want to close on because People are listening to this, you know, everyone has dreams, goals, we want to be successful. What is explicit ambition and what is next for your work in this area? Ooh, I love this. Okay. Explicit ambition is a term that I coined because I was, you know, for a woman to have an ambition, to, sh- to have a big goal, a big dream for herself, that is like a, a, a radically feminist act, again, because for, for so much of our history, for generations and generations, it was not acceptable for women to want things for ourselves. It always had to be in service of somebody else. And so what I find is that we as women leaders can have this hangover of having to have ambition sort of filtered through the lens of how does this help everybody around me? Which on the one hand, you know, it's, it's great to help people around you. But to me, explicit ambition is giving ourselves the permission to trust ourselves and trust the wisdom of the intention of just the pure intentions, goals, and desires that we have. It'll save us a lot of time. Um, one thing I know and have observed from working with powerhouse women leaders is that they tend to outgive, out donate, out support, you know, their <laughs> male counterparts. So have the explicit ambition, build the castle that you want to build, build the legacy and trust that that's going to have huge ripple effects for the people around you. That's what explicit ambition is. And for me, the next thing I am in final edits of my book, it's called Explicit Ambition. It's coming out in the spring. I'm super excited about it. Um, you know, can't wait. Can't wait to have this piece of work out there in the world. That's what's next for me. This is so exciting. It is going to change the game for so many women and men who read it. And I just, I'm over the moon. I'm, I'm dancing in my chair about this. Eleanor, we'll have to have you back when the book comes out to talk about the what you found. Um, But for now, I want to honor you and thank you for this amazing conversation. Everything you do is world-class from your preeminent podcast to your messaging, how you show up and really the clarity that you have around these issues. And I know that you serve at such a big, huge level for all your clients and and those that love you. So thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thank you.